Even in a disappointing season, there are always lessons to be learned. Today, we'll talk about three of the biggest ones for the New Orleans Pelicans, including one that could lead to a blockbuster trade. It's a Thursday episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter, here with y'all on this Thursday, and we're going to look at some of the biggest lessons learned for the Pelicans this season, including in this first one. One that could lead to a massive roster shakeup and a very big trade. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday for y'all, breaking down this team like no one else is, completely free. Completely free. There's no charge. All I ask if you want to support the channel, try and listen one day more a week than you normally do. Try and become an everydayer and comment down below on YouTube. So... Let's get into it. There, there's a lot of lessons, I think, to be learned. I went over kind of one yesterday when we were talking about assistant coach Jaron Collins. This defense was good. I think the defense can be good this coming year. That's a lesson to be learned. But that isn't as insightful or interesting to me as some of these other ones that I think do impact the Pelicans offseason to a degree. So let's start with this. First lesson learned, I think, that I take away that really is going to impact what the Pelicans do soon is Jonas Valanciunas isn't the long-term center for the Pelicans and is probably not going to be on the team next year. That is not to say that Jonas Valanciunas is bad. I think he is an underrated center. I'm going to sneeze. I've been like trying to hold it in. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. I've been trying. I was trying to hold that in, and I don't have like a cough button, a mute button. I don't like to edit the show. I like to just do this all in one take. So forgive me there. So Jonas Valanciunas isn't going to be on the team next year. Shouldn't be the starting center. Isn't the long term center. When you look at the Pelicans in terms of minutes per game, Jonas Valanciunas ranks six for the Pels, basically at twenty five minutes per game. That's not terrible. But when you look at it, Jonas Valanciunas is the third highest paid player on the team at $14.7 million this year. He's going to make next year over that, or does it the exact same? 15.435 next year. You can't pay that much salary to a guy that's getting the six most minutes, and more importantly, a guy that you don't close games with. And this is really where this comes down to it. Jonas Valanciunas, I think, is an underrated center. I thought he was very good for the Pelicans this year. There are limitations that he has, yes, but I don't really think he was much of the problem for anything that they did. 14 points per game, 10.2 rebounds per. He shot 35% from three on you know very limited attempts, but does work down low. The problem is defensively. You have to play drop coverage with him. If you put him out there on the perimeter, he gets eaten alive, and he's not much of a rim protector shot blocker though he's a big body and does have some rim deterrence that's different than rim protection so I don't th think he's a bad player I think he's better defensively than he's giving credit for even but if you're not going to play him what what's the point and I think that's really what you saw here Willie Green wants to go a different route and wants their different defense to do other things. And that just kind of means that Jonas is going to be frozen out. I don't think that it's a confidence thing. I don't think it's like, well, he's not going to want to be involved if he doesn't think he's good. This dude is absolutely a pro and will do what he's told and what he's asked to do. But you just can't pay him that kind of money if you're not going to really use him, if you're not going to close games with him. Earlier in the week, if you're an everydayer, you listened to my show where I talked about the Pelicans salary cap and some of the limitations that they have. You know, at the trade deadline, they dumped Devontae Graham for Josh Richardson, who was fine, but that move was also largely a salary dump to clear space for this coming year. They're up against the luxury tax. Having a guy at over $15 million is isn't ideal unless he's kind of a core guy, and Valanciunas isn't. So, this is kind of where my thought process is. Two ways and what to do here. 
You've heard me say this before. Just get a cheap starting center. Move on from Valanciunas, trade him, dump him, whatever, however you want to do it. And sign a guy, Mason Plumley for the Clippers, who comes off the bench, to be your starting center in name only. And he's going to play seven minutes to start the first half, seven minutes to start the second half, maybe a couple of spot minutes here and there in there. Just to be a big body that rebounds till you close small with Larry Nance Jr. or someone else. And you pay him $5 million, something like that, so that even if he doesn't play a lot of minutes, even if he's a starter in name only, he's not clogging up your salary cap sheet or anything like that. Or, and I wonder if this is the direction the Pelicans are going to go, you make a trade, a big trade, for a guy like Miles Turner. I'm not the biggest Miles Turner fan, but if you want someone with size out there, and Turner has that at 6'11", to maybe help you in certain areas while also being a good three-point shooter 37 percent on over four on four attempts per game this year you know while I'm not a Turner guy that's not bad and that fits well with Zion Williamson and can space the court a little bit for him he also does give you good enough rim protection 2.3 blocks per game this year 2.8 the year before that 3.4 three years ago that led the league those are good numbers. Now, his blocks, I think, are a little bit of like empty stats, swats the ball out of bounds so the opponent retains possession. But your defense can get set, and that's what the Pelicans do a very good job of uh, when they attack. So you could sell me on Miles Turner. The problem is with him is he's just not a great defensive rebounder at seven and a half per game this past year. He's just not great in that regard. So if you were frustrated by them going small with Larry Nance Jr. and you're like, cool, they'll put Miles Turner out there. I don't know if that's going to fix exactly what the problem for the Pelicans was. That worries me a little bit. He's not a bad defensive rebounder, but I wouldn't call him good in any capacity. You know, Jonas Valanciunas this year grabbed 33 point. He had a defensive rebounding percentage of 33.3. Defensive rebounding percentage is basically an estimate of the percentage of all available defensive rebounds a player grabbed while they were on the court. Last year was 31.2. Year before that was 31.9, so 32. So this is a guy who basically grabs a third of all available defensive rebounds when he's out there on the court. By comparison, Miles Turner... This past year was 22.9. So he's grabbing one out of every five or so, one out of every four, and Valanciunas is grabbing one out of every three. There is a stark difference between those two numbers. Larry Nance Jr., his defensive rebounding percentage was 20.3. So it's closer to that number for Miles Turner, and that checks out. That's a problem. Miles Turner is going to be making... Uh, 17 something million next year. So it's kind of in the ballpark of Valanciunas. Are you going to close with him? Can he defend on the perimeter a little bit, but not really. But it is a guy that the Pelicans, I think, kind of like. And if Valanciunas isn't going to be it, get Willie Green a center that he's going to play. And that could be Miles Turner. And I would not be shocked if that ends up being a big move that the team makes this offseason. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Are you a Miles Turner fan? Are you not? I could go either way on it. But I do think they need to address the center position if Jonas Valanciunas isn't really who Willie Green wants to kind of roll with. So coming up next, more takeaways, lessons learned. Let's look at Trey Murphy. So the lesson learned here is simple. This dude can be special. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Before we do that, though, today's episode of Locked on Pelicans is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay's guaranteed fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the G green check mark to know the part will fit or your money back. Of a 1976 Corvette, I'm working on. I work on all of my cars. There's no worse feeling than getting a part that isn't exactly right. And look, you can't, you, you don't want to kind of bang that in there to make it work. It just doesn't happen. It's a problem. Shop once, get the part you need. I just ordered a bunch of stuff from there, including a, a brake bleeder kit to 
firm that brake pedal up a little bit and do it by myself. So with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here. No one else comes to you like this completely free. Every dayers tomorrow on the show, we're looking at Trey Young and and Draymond Green. Let's go out firing on a Friday and end, end the week. High note, low note, we'll see. Let's get your thoughts and my thoughts on Trey Young and Draymond Green. Do Potential options for the Pelicans, I think, this offseason. We'll break that all down in tomorrow's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Today, we're talking about takeaways from this season, lessons learned. We just went over Jonas Valanciunas. Today, let's look at Trey Murphy the third. The lesson here is this dude can be special. Trey Murphy looks like he could be a second option on a team. Third option sooner rather than later. He was... Flat out excellent for the New Orleans Pelicans this season. 14.5 points per game, 3.6 rebounds, but the number you really look at is 40.6% from three on over six attempts per game. This dude is a shooter. This dude is a shooter and a scorer. He can do it all, man. And when you look at him and watch the way his game evolved offensively, Started off as a three-point shooter, added that kind of downhill attacking the basket game as he worked hard to get into the dunk contest where he made the finals and arguably could have won. Then as the season went on, you saw better footwork, more moves to create some space and separation, and then a floater, a mid-range jumper, becoming a guy that looks like he can score at all three levels in the NBA. And with good size at 6'9", 6'10", He seems like a guy that is going to be a strong player and a solidified starter at some point sooner rather than later in the future. He had a 41-point game this year, and I had to go and see, was he the leading scorer for the team in terms of points per game uh, in in a single game? You had Zion with 43, Brandon Ingram with 42, CJ with 42, and Trey Murphy with 41. Think about that for a second. He was keeping pace with those guys. It was against Portland. That helps. But certainly to be able to go above 40 is absolutely a really big deal for a player like this. We've seen him a couple of times where he had 10 or more made threes. Getting close to that. He had uh, against the Clippers, he was 10 of 12. That's impressive. This is a guy that is a really special player. If he starts to put it together on defense, becomes a better rebounder, gets a little bit lost on defense at times, but becomes a better rebounder, and he has the size for it, this is a player that is going to be key. This is a team that's not in a great spot in terms of the salary cap. Went over that a couple days ago on the show. And eventually you're going to have to lose one of Brandon Ingram or CJ McCollum. It just feels like that long term. Now, that might be three, four years from now, but you need a replacement there. Trust me, Trey Murphy looks like he's going to be that replacement. You can look at the numbers going from 5.4 points per game to 14.5 this season, even though I don't think that really tells the entirety of the story of how good he was post-All-Star break for this team after he got kind of benched for a little bit and then came on really strong once he was back into the starting lineup. And once he was back into the starting lineup for the final 19 games that he played, 20.4 points per game, 45% from three. Those are really, really good numbers. He's clearly capable of taking on a larger role. So here's the thing about the jump up in the points per game from 5.4 to 14.5 is the usage rate. And this is something that's really important when it comes to this Pelicans team. The usage rate, as I explained some advanced stats today, it's an estimate of the percentage of team plays used by that player when they were on the court, on the floor. Did they get the ball? Did they shoot? Did they turn it over? Did they draw a shooting foul and go to the free throw line? Those are the type of things, plus maybe one or two other things, that it's kind of looking at. Basically, did a possession end in some capacity with this guy having the ball in his hands? Usage rate, You want your top players to have a high one. They do it. Brandon Ingram is at 30.8%. 
Zion Williamson is at 30.4%. When those two guys are on the court, they're using over 60% of a team's possessions. CJ McCollum, 26.4%. Valanchunas, 23.4%. You get what I'm saying. Trey Murphy, last year, when he scored 5.4 points per game, had a usage rate of 15.7. Okay? This year, big jump in points per game, right? Should be a jump in usage rate. Not really. 16.6. It didn't even go up 1%. He just became way more efficient with his basketball. Really, the three-point shooting coming alive and then scoring efficiently at the rim. That number, his true shooting percentage, which is a real important statistic that looks at and takes into account efficiency that two-pointers are worth more than three-pointers, and it also factors in free throws where he's a 90% shooter. So it's trying to kind of create an all-encompassing number. Shooting 33% from three is the equivalent of shooting 50% from two. It kind of merges all of that together. That jumped from 55.8% last year to 65% this year. That's a great number. He's a very efficient player, which means he's perfect to have alongside high usage rate stars in Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram. And if he can score like he did with a usage rate like that during this time, this is a special player. He's going to get a huge contract when he is eligible for one in the future, and the Pelicans certainly are going to want to keep him. This is a guy that's going to get the freaking bag with what we've seen from him this year. That shooting, the ability to shoot quickly, to do it from deep threes as well, and then attack off the dribble and then adding more to his game, Oh boy, if he gets good defensively, watch out league. This is a guy that could be really special. Huge lesson learned from the Pelicans this year. They need to really start to include him more in the offense than what we've seen. And this is a guy that could be a 30 point per game scorer, it feels like at times. He's not going to get there. That's a lot. But you get what I'm saying. So we got one more big lesson learned. And I think this could be good or bad depending on how you view it. And I'm going to be curious what you think in the comments. And it has to do with the Zion Williamson. And riding or dying with Zion Williamson. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. And thank you for making Locked on Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday. No one else comes to you like this. It's the off season. I haven't missed a show. Not going to miss a show for a while. We'll get into draft coverage soon. We'll get into free agency. We'll talk trades. We're going to break down everything you want to know about this Pelicans team. I got a lot of fun shows planned. I'm excited. Every day is tomorrow. Trey Young, Draymond Green. Oh boy, we're going to have some fun on Friday and go out with a bang. And today, we're looking at lessons learned. So, the third one that I don't know if it's good or bad yet. I think it's good. I think it's good. I promise I think it's good. But you never know. And you might think differently. The Pelicans have to. Ride or die with Zion Williamson. I think what we've seen from that. And this is for a couple of reasons. So first and foremost, man, he's still a special player when healthy. You know, when I when I searched to see the Pelicans' leading score by game to see where Trey was on that leaderboard with his 41-point game against the Portland Trailblazers, it's like, oh yeah, Zion had that ridiculous game against the Timberwolves right before the new year. December 28th against the Timberwolves, 43 points on 21 shot attempts. That's bonkers. That's bonkers, in my opinion, to see something like that. And it reminds you just how special of a player he is. He was 14 for 21, 14 of 19 from the free throw line, with five assists, and he had 43 points. That is an efficient freaking game. And this team, when he was healthy... They were really good this year. I got to look up their record. I think, I forget what it was. They were 17 and 12 with him. Something along those lines. Pelicans record was Zion Williams in this season. Cool. That saved that. They were 17 and 12 with him this season. When you look at that in terms of winning percentage, that is, I can do the quick math here. That is not how you do that. It would be 17 divided by 29, and I don't know what the heck I typed. Hold on. That's 58.6%. 58.6%. When you do that, that slots them in this year at 
the one, two, three, four, five, six best record, only behind Milwaukee, Boston, Philly, Denver, Cleveland, and ahead of Memphis. They would have been the two seed in the Western Conference. Think about that for a second. If they kept winning at the rate that they were with Zion out there, they would have been the two seed in the Western Conference. That's really good. That's really good. So he's a generational talent. And as we talked about Zion two days ago, you got to do everything you can to make sure he's going to be out there on the court three days ago, Monday show. And everyone needs to get aligned on that because that's how you are going to win a title here. You're not going to win it probably by trading him. I get the frustration with the missing games and him not attacking his rehab and being the true professional he needs to be and the stuff with, you know, his camp. But man, when you get someone that does that for you, you've got to try and maximize that and roll with it. And that's why I do think the Pelicans need to ride or die with Zion Williamson. The other factor with that also is this. If you were to put him on the trade market, what would you get? You're not going to get max value for him. They'd get a good offer for him. They wouldn't get like peanuts for him. There would be teams and lots of teams lining up. Every team in the league would at least call. And I bet you a lot of teams would put good offers on the table. But you're not going to get the maximum value for him. It could arguably be the lowest it's ever been right now. So that's another reason not to trade him because you're not getting good It's not good asset management. You're not getting good returns on a player that if you move on from, you need to get a good return from on. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why you wouldn't end up moving on from him either in the moment. But let me know what you think down below. So those are three of my biggest takeaways. I think the three most interesting takeaways, lessons learned from the Pelicans this season. Jonas Valanciunas not being the long-term center. Miles Turner, anybody? Trey Murphy, and you got to include him more, and then riding or dying with Zion Williamson. What are your other big takeaways? There's tons more. The defense, Herb Jones coming alive at the end of the year. How important is a guy like um, Jose Alvarado to this team, too? Do they just need to go all in on shooting? Could be another one. There's a lot. Let me know what your three biggest are in the comments down below on YouTube. And that's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Pelicans. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. I'll be back with you all tomorrow. Let's talk Trey Young and Draymond Green.